Okay, so we know that uh, Dr. King Day is uh, coming up uh, January uh, 20th, 2020. We know his uh, birthday was uh, this past week, January 15th. And you'll see a lot of celebrations of Dr. King. And the oftentimes the Dr. King that is presented is a figment of people's imaginations. It's not the revolutionary Dr. King that actually existed. It's this, you know, lovable Dr. King that wanted everybody to get along when he really wanted people to change their ways and he was talking about dismantling white supremacy and racism. And he was calling America out on America's hypocrisy. Okay, so it's not the Dr. King that they show us on the television uh, uh, every Dr. King day. That's not the real Dr. King. So there was an article that I saw. I saw a number of articles, and I have a number of articles on Dr. King. Um, first of all, I encourage people to read Dr. King's books. He wrote five books. And, you know, I, I speak here and there at Dr. King Day celebrations because I don't get asked to speak at a lot of Dr. King Day celebrations. Because I don't, the, the, a lot of this, a, a, a lot of the stuff that they push at these corporate breakfasts on Dr. King and these corporate sponsored lunches and things like that, that's a, um, that's a, you know, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. This doesn't apply to everybody. A lot of that is, is, a, is a Dr. King to make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African Americans. Okay? Because if you go study, if you go study the real Dr. King, that's not who that is being presented. And and this is one of the problems when we go to the federal government to ask them, or even if you want to use the term demand, them to honor one of our heroes they killed. This is one of the problems because then it opens it up to their legacy being distorted to make them more palatable, more acceptable to the larger society, okay? I remember I, uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakin is saying we did Dr. King a disservice when we went to the federal government trying to get a, a, a holiday for him. He said, if you want to celebrate Dr. King, he said, we don't ask permission, we just do it. We don't ask permission to celebrate Malcolm X's birthday, May 19th. We just celebrate Malcolm's birthday. We don't ask permission from the government to do that. We don't ask permission to celebrate Marcus Garvey's birthday, August 17th. We just do it. Fannie Lou Hamer's birthday, things like this. We have to get out of that. So I've seen a number of articles, and I'm going to share a few of them with you. And I got a stack of articles, and I have a whole file at home on Dr. King, things like this, just like the FBI had a file on them as well. You know, I got a file of articles dealing with Dr. King, etc. I've done a lecture, The Distortion of the Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., The Revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. But SmithsonianMag.com has a good article. In uh, my lecture on Dr. King is available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have it on digital download also, okay, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. SmithsonianMag.com, official website of the Smithsonian Institute, has a really good article entitled, Even Though He Is Revered Today, MLK Was Widely Disliked by the American Public When He Was Killed. Even though he is revered today, MLK was widely disliked by the American public when he was killed. 75% of Americans disapproved of the civil rights leader as he spoke out against the Vietnam War and economic disparity. So he's been largely a lot of this, a lot, a lot of this uh, revisionist history surrounding Dr. King. Focuses on a speech that was retrospectively called I Have a Dream. Because that that one, the speech wasn't about a damn dream. This is why I keep telling people, why y'all keep having all this dream stuff? The, the, the speech wasn't about a dream. The speech was about, first of all, the original name of the speech was called Normalcy Never Again. Then later it was it, then it was changed to a canceled check. It's only going to be after the speech was given that it's going to be renamed I Have a Dream. The speech was about holding America accountable for a promissory note that was given to African Americans a hundred years prior in 1863. And he said when we took that promissory note to the bank, it was marked insufficient funds. 
he's saying the promissory note that was given to us was no good. And he's talking about holding America accountable for their promise to us and calling America out on their hypocrisy. He's talking about police brutality. He's talking about voter suppression. He's talking about Jim Crow. He's talking about Negroes moving from a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. He's talking about white supremacy and racism and violence inflicted upon African Americans. This is what the speech is about. The speech wasn't about us holding hands. Mahalia Jackson, who sung two songs earlier in the day, because he, see, Dr. King was the last speak, uh, speaker. This is August 28, 1963, at the March on Washington. Mahalia Jackson yells out, tell him about the dream, Martin. And if you watch the actual video of it, and you turn up the sound, you can hear him say that. If you studied this, you know this. So then he shifts, and he starts talking about, a, uh, he references a speech he gave two months prior in Detroit. And he starts talking about, quote unquote, what they call the dream. But the dream is after they dis after you dismantle white supremacy and racism. Okay? The beloved society. That's after you dismantle white supremacy and racism. What's happened today largely is his legacy has been distorted and co-opted. People want to deal with the quote unquote dream after you dismantle white supremacy and racism. But don't want to deal with dismantling white supremacy and racism. In many cases don't even want to acknowledge it still exists. So this is the this is the this is the three car money shell game that's being played. This is the shell game that's being played on us. So this is why we have to study the real Dr. King. This is Dr. King's last book. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Okay? Chaos or community. Where do we go from here? Written in 1967. Is his uh, worst selling book, probably his best book, okay? And chapter two of his book is entitled Black Power because it's about the Black Power movement, all right? So, people, we, we need to study Dr. King. The most important, I know people, I know they've turned Dr. King Day into a day of service. Personally, I think it should be a day of research, Dr. King, because most of these people, because most of us don't understand them. Haven't researched him. Never read any of his speeches. Never read any books that he wrote. Don't understand toward the end of Dr. King's life and Malcolm X's life, they were both assassinated at 39, their ideologies were converging. It wasn't that Dr. King was becoming more like Malcolm X. They were both becoming more like each other. Read Mal Martin Malcolm in America, uh, Martin Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare by James H. Cone. James H. Cone is known as the father of black liberation theology. I read this book back in college, back in, I think it was 94. Yeah, back in 94. And this book goes through painstakingly and documents and shows how their ideologies are converging. You are, you've already heard the, toward, the end of, toward the end of their lives. You've already heard me talk about how from 66 to 68, Dr. King shifts from focusing on civil rights to human rights. And he's focusing on the poor people's campaign. You've heard me talk about how... Um, 1963, July 31st, 1963, Malcolm sends a letter, uh, sends letters to the leading civil rights leaders calling for a meeting with them, calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders and their followers. He also sends one to Dr. King. This is the month before the March on Washington. The March on Washington was August 28, 1963. Malcolm sends this letter July 31st, 1963, while he's still in the Nation of Islam. Malcolm was calling for a unification of the civil rights leaders, and he said we have to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. He said it's a shame that John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, and Nikita Khrushchev could set aside their major differences, and Nikita Khrushchev was the, the, was the uh, leader of the Soviet Union at the time. He said it's a shame that they can set aside their major differences and, and meet but Negro leaders cannot set aside their minor differences and meet. And then we know when uh, Malcolm officially uh, separates from the Nation of Islam, March 8, 1964, we know later that same month, he meets Dr. King for the first and only time, March 26, 1964, at the U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act of 1960, uh, which is going to be passed in 65, okay? They meet March 26, 1964. The month after that, 
Malcolm delivers his speech, The Battle of the Bullet, April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio, April 4th, 1964 in Detroit. When I tell people when we, when we start quoting Malcolm, you got to understand context and chronology. So when we talk about the Battle of the Bullet, and he's talking about the Democratic Party, he's talking about the Northern Democrats who, who are more liberal and the Southern Segregationist Democrats. And he's talking, and this was after he met Dr. King, this was about a week or so after he meets Dr. King, and after he's there for the U.S. Senate debate on the Civil Rights Act. But that speech was given before the Civil Rights Act was passed, which was passed July, I think July 2nd, 1964. And Malcolm is assassinated February 21st, 1965, before the Voting Rights Act of 65 was passed, which was passed August 6th, was signed into law August 6th, 1965. He doesn't get to see that coming to fruition. So when we quote Malcolm, we have to understand context, plus the Battle of the Bullet was also given before Malcolm goes to Mecca. He goes to Mecca late April 64. So we have to understand context. So I encourage people to read this book, Malcolm X Speaks, by, um, edited with uh, uh, notes by George Brightman, because this has a lot of Malcolm's most important speeches when he leads the nation of Islam. Because Malcolm's ideology is, is, is evolving. Okay? And then June 28, 1964, we know Malcolm announces the formation of the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And he lays out a platform which includes economic empowerment, education, includes a political agenda as well. If you go to blackpast.org, P-A-S-T, blackpast.org, you can read the whole transcript of the speech. And we know that it was Dr. John Henry Clark one of our great Grandmaster Scholar Warriors who helped Malcolm organize the OAU, the Organization of Afro-American Unity. So read the article from uh, the Washington Post. You heard me talk about it before. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. met Malcolm X just once. The photo still haunts us with what was lost. This is an excellent, excellent article written by Deneen L. Brown and Malcolm joins the, the uh, Civil Rights Movement um, when he uh, separates from the Nation of Islam. And in the Battle of the Bullet, he's talking about interjecting black nationalism into the Civil Rights Movement. And when he meets Dr. King, March 26, 1964, he tells Dr. King, I'm throwing myself into the heart of the Civil Rights struggle. So when we look at this article from SmithsonianMag.com, official website of the Smithsonian Institute, even though he is revered today, MLK was widely disliked by the American public when he was killed. It says, according to an early 1968 Harris poll, P-O-L-L, -L, the man whose half century of martyrdom we celebrate this, this week died with a public disapproval rating of nearly 75%, a figure shocking in its own to, uh, in its own day, a figure shocking in its own day, and still striking even in today's highly polarized political climate. White racial resentment was still a critical factor at that point. But Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s unfavorable numbers were at least 25 points higher in 1968 than in 1963. And his faltering appeal over the final years of his life was also a consequence of appearing to fall behind his times in some respect even as he was leaping well ahead of them in others. A day after returning home in December 1964 from a tour whose most important stop was Oslo, Oslo, Norway, the Nobel, uh, the Nobel Laureate for Peace joined a picket line at Atlanta, Atlanta's Scripto Pen Factory. They manufacture pens. Scripto, S-C-R-I-P-T-O. Atlanta's Scripto Pen Factory, writing pens. This, was, this pen factory was where some 700 workers were striking for better wages for less skilled employees. Though it was a remarkably humble gesture, for someone who had received such a lofty affirmation, the Nobel Peace Prize, okay? Dr. King's actions that day and his call for a nationwide boycott of uh, scripto products won him few friends in his hometowns, in his hometown's white 
staunchly anti-union business community. His picketing also foreshadowed a future in which Dr. King would move beyond the bloody battles against blatantly illegal state and local racial practices in places like Birmingham, Alabama and Selma, and Selma Alabama. Not content, not content with the gains registered in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Dr. King resolved to pursue a more expansive, aggressive, and to some white Americans especially, unsettling socioeconomic and political agenda. One that would draw him into another fateful labor dispute some three and a half years later in Memphis, Tennessee. While still, how much time we got before the break? Okay. While still involved in the Scripto Pen Factory affair, Dr. King sat down for a, an interview with Playboy magazine, and the interview was conducted by Alex Haley. Alex Haley, who wrote Roots. In this interview, Dr. King endorsed a massive federal aid program for African Americans. Its whopping $50 billion price tag was, he pointed out, less than the annual U.S. spending for defense. Such an expenditure, he argued, would be more than justified in, quote, a spectacular decline, end quote, in school dropouts, family breakups, crime rates, Ill uh, illegitimacy, swollen relief rolls, rioting, and other social evils. Now this is before, this is 64, so this is before the um, National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorder, which was commissioned in uh, 67. I think that was June of, uh, July of 67. Um, yeah, July 28, 1967, by President Johnson, known as the Kerner Commission, okay? Blackpass.org has a very good article on this, National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, 1967, Kerner Commission, okay? Read that article also. But this is three years before that. This is in 64 that this interview takes place with uh, Playboy magazine, all right? So, um, so, that, so many poor whites were, quote, in the very same boat with the Negro, Dr. King added. And if they could be persuaded to join forces with African Americans, they could form, quote, a grand alliance, end quote, a grand alliance, and, quote, exert massive pressure on the government to get jobs for all, end quote. So Dr. King had made passing allusions to this possibility before, but a straightforward call for an active biracial coalition of have-nots was just a terif was just as terrifying to white ruling elites, be they on Peachtree Street or Wall Street, as it had been when raised by the populace in the 1890s. So, Dr. King did nothing to quell these concerns when he told David Halberstam that he had been abandoned that, that he had abandoned the incremental approach to social change of his civil rights protest days in favor of pursuing quote a reconstruction of the entire society a rev a revolution of values a reconstruction of the entire society a revolution of values, end quote. One which would, quote, look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation. Look uneasily on the glaring contrast, contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation. All right, we're coming up on a break. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break, and I'm going to play a clip for you of an interview with Dr. King and Muhammad Ali from March 30th, 1967. You, want, you don't want to go anywhere at 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio, the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is 
Sunday, January 19, 2020, Dr. King Day weekend. And we know a lot of people will, will be going to Dr. King Day celebrations. And uh, so we're dealing with some history, Dr. King, some of the stuff that you're not going to hear oftentimes at some of the Dr. King Day celebrations, depending upon who organizes them. And, um, you know, so we, we deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. Um, so I encourage people, you know, I know they made Dr. King Day into a day of serving me. Really, I think it should be a day of research, researching Dr. King, because unfortunately, a lot of us don't uh, really understand the real Dr. King, what he went through, don't understand the, the him connected to the civil rights movement, uh, him connected to Malcolm X, uh, Dr. King connected to Muhammad Ali, Maya Angelou, and uh, others. Because Maya Angelou worked with Dr. King and she worked with Malcolm X. Because Malcolm meets Dr. Uh, Maya Angelou in Ghana in 1964 when Ghana, after Malcolm goes on his Hajj, uh, and then he uh, he goes on his Hajj to Mecca, and then he goes on a tour of uh, uh, 14 different African nations, and he meets um, uh, Maya Angelou in uh, Ghana. Okay, and she ends up uh, working with him and, and coming back to the U.S. working with him on the organization of Afro-American unity. And then we also know Dr. King, 1957, goes to Ghana to be with Kwame Nkrumah for the um, celebration of Ghana's independence from Great Britain. And then he goes back on the anniversary of their uh, independence each year. Before that, he goes to Ghana. So Dr. King was connected to Africa as well. A lot of people don't know this. Dr. King was connected to Africa. See, this is, this is some more of the, the nonsensical lies that are told about Dr. King. All right. Uh, it, there was a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com. Uh, this article is entitled "How Steel Sharpens Steel." How Steel Sharpens Steel. And it's about the African liberation movement and the civil rights movement because as Dr. John Henrik Clark correctly teaches us, the African liberation movement on the continent of Africa and the civil rights movement in this country were happening concurrently. They're happening at the same time. And we are drawing inspiration from each other and learning from each other. How steel sharpened steel. The connection between the civil rights movement and African independence movements. This is by Jamal Bradley, April 3rd, 2016. Okay? Um, so read, uh, so uh, check this out. And he talks about, um, uh, let's see, all across Afri Africa on the backs of buses and other forms of transportation, you'll see pictures of Muhammad Ali, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. And what makes this important is that they are not simply a coincidence. One of the most dynamic periods in African history was during the 1950s and 1960s when many African nations achieved independence from the European colonial powers. In 1957, Ghana gained its independence from Britain and was soon followed by 17 other African nations in 1960 and numerous others in the following years. Independence leaders such as uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Namdia Azikwe, Patrice Lumumba, Seiko Ture, and other figures were influential in developing the political and cultural structure to make independence a reality. Interesting, interestingly enough, one of the most dynamic periods in black American history was in the 1950s and 1960s in what is commonly known as the Civil Rights Era. During this time, African Americans began to fur further assert their rights, not just their American rights, but also their human rights as citizens of the world. What should be known is that these two movements were not completely separated, nor were the ideas and strategies implemented independent of one another. By the 1950s, many Africans began to take advantage of the opportunity to study in the United States. And due to the racial nature of American society during that era, most students attended historically black colleges and universities. As noted, Lincoln University boasts two African presidents as alumni. 
and other HBCUs during that era had numerous students from across the continent. The development and change which occurred in Africa and America were contemporary movements. The development and change which occurred in Africa and America were contemporary movements and their collective success were viewed as such. The African leaders and people were very much influenced by their experiences in America at HBCUs and their time spent living, talking, and learning among black American activists and thinkers. Kwame Nkrumah, who was, was, who was a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, I'm just saying, he was one of my frat brothers. And Krumah was so much influenced by his time in America that he would name Ghana's football team the Black Stars after the shipping line company started by Marcus Garvey. During the 1950s and 1960s and in the subsequent independence era, a number of African Americans were invited to Africa to give advice on overcoming the colonial system. Independence leaders recognized the benefit of Americans of uh, the, recognized the benefit of American ideas and saw black Americans as natural allies to their nations. The contribution of Dr. W.B. Du Bois was invaluable in that he offered a scholarly critique of colonialism at the United Nations and he offered advice and regular feedback to African independence leaders in their nascent years. His assistance would be rewarded in the later years of his life as he relocated to Ghana where he would serve as a political advisor to Nkrumah until his death. And, and, and Dr. Dubois, he died, I think it was the day before the March on Washington, because he didn't attend the March on Washington 63. I think he died like the day before, it was either the day before or the day of uh, uh, he passed away, okay? And it was from the spirit of the African independence movements that many African American leaders began to envision their own struggle for human rights in America. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. attended Ghana, Ghana's independence ceremony and went on to note, quote, This event, the birth of this new nation, will give impetus to oppressed peoples all over the world. I think it will have worldwide implications and repercussions, not only for Asia and Africa, but also for America. It renews my conviction in the ultimate triumph of justice, end quote. In addition to Dr. King, other figures such as Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Representative Adam Clayton Powell Jr. from, from uh, Harlem, uh, A. Philip Randolph, Ralph Bunch, Horace Mann Bond, and others traveled to Ghana for the ceremony. During this era, many American government leaders began to view the civil rights movement with greater suspicion and active, actively began to monitor its leaders and their international ties. In the late 1950s, Malcolm X would go on a fact-finding mission on behalf of Elijah Muhammad, but would make his, more, uh, make his more important and ultimately influential trip to Africa in 1964 upon leaving the Nation of Islam. It was during this trip to Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, Liberia, Egypt, Algeria, Ethiopia, Morocco, Tanzania, then known as Tanganyika and Guinea, that Malcolm X began, be, be, uh, began to further refine his position on race and the struggle for African Americans. Malcolm X noted that in Africa, the people were able to achieve a higher level of independence and freedom than in America, quote, which is supposed to be the citadel of freedom, end quote. America is supposed to be the citadel of freedom. Malcolm was noticing that uh, people were able to achieve, Africans were able to achieve a higher level of independence and freedom in the African countries than in America. It was during Malcolm's trip to Africa and the support he received from leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Nkrumah uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser, uh, Ben Bella, and others that he formulated his ideas to take this case of African Americans to the United Nations. Malcolm's trip to Africa, Malcolm's trips to Africa were the impetus to transform his challenge to America's treatment of African Americans 
as not just an issue of civil rights, but one of human rights. He noted how the atrocities committed in Africa, Hungary, Latin America, the Congo, and among the Jewish people of the Soviet Union were brought before the United Nations, yet the problems of the African Americans were relegated to the United States. Many observers have identified this shift in Malcolm's strategy actually made him a bigger threat to the global influence of the American government and quite possibly led to his untimely death. Okay, so you can read the rest of this article. This is um, from 2016. This is an excellent article from AtlantaBlackStar.com. AtlantaBlackStar.com, April 3rd, 2016. So this is the day before the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, which was April 4th, right, 1968. How Steel Sharpened Steel, the connection between the civil rights movement and African independence movements. Also, today is the birthday of one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. So shout out to Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, one of our great grandmaster scholar warriors as well. Uh, his birthday is today, his earth day is today. All right. So uh, let me post a link here to this article also. Okay, check that out at AtlantaBlackStar.com. Now, right before the break, I was sharing an article from SmithsonianMag.com entitled, Even Though He Is Revered Today, MLK Was Widely Disliked, MLK Was Widely Disliked by the American Public When He Was Killed. Okay, and right before the break, we were talking about his involvement in this uh, uh Script, scripto pen factory uh, boycott that was taking place in Atlanta and then he was he was interviewed in 1964 by Alex Haley for Playboy magazine. Dr. King did nothing to uh, so Dr. King had made passing allusions to the possibility before of a grand alliance between poor African Americans and poor white people. But a straightforward call for an active biracial coalition of have-nots was just as terrifying to white ruling elites, be they on Peachtree Street, Peachtree Street, I guess they're referring to the one in, well, there's a number of them in Atlanta, or Wall Street, as it had been when raised by the populace in the 1890s. Now, Dr. King did nothing to quell these uh, concerns when he later told David Hal Halberstam uh, that he had abandoned the incremental approach to social change of his civil rights protest days in favor of pursuing, quote, a reconstruction of the entire society, a revolution of values, end quote, one of which would, quote, look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation, end quote. So, Dr. King's vision of a revolution in values was not purely domestic. In April 1967, he denounced American involvement in Vietnam, once at his own Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and once at Riverside Church in New York before 3,000 people. On April 4th, 1967, precisely a year before he was killed, he decried the hypocrisy of sending young black men, quote, 8,000 miles to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they, had, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia or East Harlem, end quote. Now, I want to go to this first clip. This is an uh, excerpt of an interview with Malcolm e between uh, Dr. King and Muhammad Ali. This is from March 30th, 1967, just a few days before Dr. King delivers his first speech in opposition to the Vietnam War, which was on April 4th, 1967, called Beyond Vietnam. Let's go to this clip. Nothing, just friends, just like Khrushchev and, and uh, Kennedy and <laughs> everybody. When they, people, all of the politicians of all other white races come together, and they, although they believe different, they think different, whites can come together and discuss the common cause. But whenever a few of us come together, the world is shook up. And I say, whatever went back there is our business. Reverend King, do you agree? Oh, yes, yes. We had a very good discussion uh, on uh, many matters. And, of course, these are not things that we would discuss here, but uh, we do have common problems and common concerns. And, above all, 
as uh, Muhammad Ali has just said, uh, we are all victims of the same system of oppression. And even though we may have different religious uh, beliefs, uh, this does not at all That's bring right. about a difference Steel in terms brothers. of our concerns. Steel brothers. Right. Do you share the same, do, one more question, do you share the same concern uh, the, that uh, Muhammad has for his draft status? Oh, I certainly do. Uh, my, my views on the draft are very clear. I'm against it. And I think the sooner our country does away with the draft, the better it will be for everybody. I'm di very disturbed about the militaristic posture of our nation. And I think until we have a radical reordering of priorities in our country, uh, we are going more and more to the depths and, I should say, to Five, the doom four, that three. follows arrogance of power, Senator Fulbright said. Okay, so that is Courtesy Associated Press. You can find that on that clip on YouTube. Most people don't even know that that exists. So these were, the, the name of that clip is uh, MLK Talks, no, it's, that's, uh, which one? Yeah, MLK Talks New Phase of Civil Rights. No, that's not that. That is um, Ali and, Muhammad Ali and Dr. King. That is, uh, let's see, I'll give you the name of that one. Um, I think it's heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali and Dr. King. But search for that. That's from um, March 30th, 1967. I'll give you the name of that clip here in just a minute. Okay, so Dr. King and Muhammad Ali had a secret friendship. Heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali got together with civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, Martin Luther King. So that uh, uh, that's the name of that clip. That's on YouTube. Uh, Biography.com has an article, a really good article, that talks about the secret friendship between Dr. King and Muhammad Ali. And the, at, at this time here that they did that interview, March 30, 1967, these were probably the two most recognizable African-American men in the country. Uh, Malcolm X had, was assassinated two years prior. And the following month, April of 1967, um, Dr. King and Malcolm X, uh, Dr. King and Muhammad Ali are going to uh, come out uh, fully in opposition against the Vietnam War. April 4th, 1967, Dr. King delivers his speech beyond Vietnam. And then April 30th, 1967, later that same month, uh, Muhammad Ali refuses to take the step forward to be drafted into the Army to go fight in Vietnam. He shows up to the draft board, but when they do the swearing in, he refuses to take the step forward. We've seen that reenacted in the movie The Greatest, where Muhammad Ali portrays himself. So if we go back to the um, article, and, and you know, one of the things I really, I mean, it's a fantastic clip that I just played, but one of the things that's extremely important is that Muhammad Ali said we're still brothers. And what he's saying is, is that even though Dr. King is a Baptist minister, even though I'm a minister in the nation of Islam. And people think that we don't like each other and things like that. At the end of the day, we're still brothers. You know, we're, we're largely fighting for the same things, trying to get largely to the, the same place or something like that, just have different tactics, different religions. And what he said was at the beginning was that, what Muhammad Ali said at the beginning is that he, he talked about how John F. Kennedy and the Cre Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union could come together and meet and they have huge differences and it's not people don't go crazy but when Dr. King and Muhammad Ali come together all of a sudden now it's a problem so if we go back to the article from um, SmithsonianMag.com even though he is revered today MLK was widely disliked by the American public when he was killed Dr. King's uh, vision of a revolution and values was not purely domestic, okay? And April 4th, 1967, in his speech Beyond Vietnam, he decried the hypocrisy of sending young black men, quote, 8,000 miles to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia or East Harlem. Beyond that, uh, beyond that uh, lay the painful irony of seeing them join white soldiers with whom they could, quote, hardly live 
on the same block in Chicago or Atlanta, end quote, in brutal solidarity as they torched, as they torched, quote, the huts of a poor village, end quote. In this, they were, however, unwittingly agents of a U.S. policy that destroyed and depopulated the countryside, forcing its former inhabitants to take refuge in cities teeming, T-E-E-M-I-N-G, -E 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 teeming with, quote, hundreds of thousands of homeless children, end quote, who were running in packs on the streets like animals. Okay, this is Dr. King. Now, former uh, SNCC Coordinating Committee Chairman, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Chairman, Stokely Carmichael, who became Kwame Ture, observed, that in this case, Dr. King was taking on not a hapless, wholly unsympathetic villain like Birmingham, Alabama's Sheriff Eugene Bull Connor, but rather, quote, the entire policy of the United States government, end quote. The consequences were swift and severe. An outrage, President Lyndon Johnson cut off all, cut off all contact with Dr. King. This is after April 4th, 1967, Dr. King delivers his first speech in opposition to the Vietnam War called Beyond Vietnam. Overnight, he becomes the most hated man in America. President Lyndon Johnson, who signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he signed Executive Order 11246, September 1965, known as affirmative action, okay? An outraged President Johnson cut off all contact with Dr. King. And a great number of African Americans, including many old allies and colleagues from the civil rights years, warned that Dr. King's stance could have devastating consequences for their cause. Dr. King hardly fared better in pursuing his domestic agenda. It was one thing to capture public sympathy nationwide when pitted against the raw hatred and brutality that seemed the peculiar province of whites below the Mason-Dixon line. It proved quite another it proved quite another thing to persuade whites outside of the South to share their neighborhoods and share their jobs with African Americans or to support expensive federal assistance programs dedicated to helping African Americans overcome the historic disadvantages imposed on them by whites of earlier generations. So he's talking about fighting against systemic racism. He's talking about a radical change in values. He's talking about a radical restructuring of this system. Okay, we're coming up on a break. When we come back, I'm going to share with you this rare interview from May 8th, 1967 that Dr. King did with NBC News. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio, the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, January 19th, 2020. And uh, we know Dr. King Day is uh, coming up and we know a lot of people will attend Dr. King Day events and want to talk about some things, we're discussing some things that uh, oftentimes you don't hear discussed at Dr. King Day events. Oftentimes they deal with, uh, depending upon who organizes the event, uh, oftentimes they deal with the Dr. King that we see on the television every Dr. King day. They show us an emasculated Dr. King. They don't deal with the revolutionary Dr. King. They don't deal with the, the real Dr. King. Okay, so um, we were talking about this article here from uh, SmithsonianMag.com. Even though he is revered today, MLK was widely disliked by the American public when he was killed. A Harris poll in um, 1968 showed that Dr. King had uh, a disapproval rating of almost 75 percent. All right, so, uh, and then also we were talking about 
Dr. King's last book as well, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. So I encourage people to read that. Also read uh, Martin Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare by uh, James H. Cone because Dr. King and Malcolm X's ideologies were converging toward the end of both of their lives. Uh, we've been talking about uh, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X as well. Okay, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X also. All right. Um, is it, it, now, are we, are we broadcasting on 910's website? Yeah. Okay, can we use that camera? Uh, we'll Does this camera work? Yeah. Yeah, let's use that camera because the microphone's in front of my face. All right, thanks. All right. So, I want to remind you coming up uh, January 20th, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., um, Second Baptist Church in Detroit, 441 Monroe Street in Detroit. They are uh, celebrating their Dr. King Day. Uh, their theme is I've Been to the Mountaintop, What's Next? I've Been to the Mountaintop, What's Next? It's free and open to the public. I'll be there also. Uh, they validate parking at all Greektown garages and the structure across from the Anthonyum Hotel. You know, we had uh, Cleophas and Frank from Second Baptist Church on the show last Sunday. Uh, last Sunday's show, the January 12th show, is on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Just click on videos, and it's on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, okay? And they have a guest speaker uh, as well. Um, it's the pastor from Gethsemane Church out in Westland. Okay, I forgot his, forgot his last name. All right, so I want to go to this um, rare interview with uh, Dr. King. And uh, let's see here. You know what? Let's, let's go to the phone lines uh, first because we've got uh, Joe Holden. Joe on uh, line one. Joe, welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, tell us where you're calling from. Calling from Detroit, Mr. Michael. All right, how's it going? Oh, good, good. Um, you know, when I watch TV, my two favorite programs, uh, National Geographic and Documentaries. You know, because yes. I like real stuff. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. So those are my two favorite programs. Okay, mm -hmm. I was watching a documentary one time, and so J. Edgar Hoover said two things about mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King. The mm -hmm. first thing he said about Dr. Martin Luther King he said, Dr. Martin Luther King is the dumbest man in America. Mm -hmm. and the second thing he said about Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, Dr. Martin mm -hmm. Luther King is the biggest threat to America. Mm -hmm. You know, he would get all off in the papers and spread lies and false rumors on Dr. Martin Luther King and on the radio. Right. And, and the same thing we would do with Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. He'd get on the radio and t put it in TV and put it in the newspaper. And so have people believing them or lies and stuff he was doing. Right. It remind me of Trump. You know, they were the white America. As long as there was anything against uh, 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 black folks and minorities, they let him break the Constitution and do anything he wanted to do. You know, the Constitution didn't mean nothing when it comes to uh, 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 Hoover and Trump. You know, and so he would get in the papers and, uh, you know, he would say uh, on the radio and stuff, he'd say, now come back saying he lies to Muhammad, ain't no good. Mm -hmm. And he'd come the next day getting all off on the radio and in the papers and in the newspaper and say, Elijah Muhammad said Malcolm X ain't no good. Have met each other's so Right. And so, like, he yeah, had, you know, they, they, he was a big, just like Trump, J. Edgar Hoover, biggest crooks out there. <laughs> right. right all right, Joe. <laughs> Take care. All right, let's go quickly to line two. Let's go to John. John, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, John. Well, I'm calling from the east side of Detroit. Okay. Thank you for taking my call. All right. Uh, it, it, yeah, uh, Dr. King said we went to the bank and got a check with insufficient funds in the, in the bank for, with the dollar check. So, uh, I want to bring it a little closer to home if possible. Don't, don't you think that we should go to the state and, uh, and, 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 and the state and the revenue service and, and try to get out with eight, eight hundred, double hundred million dollars back from them that they're going to keep the tax pay out of the city? Uh, don't you think that we'll be okay? I mean, we could go to the state or the city and, 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 and uh, the mail and ask for our check or give us a grand home and so forth. I mean, uh, With, this Wednesday. Right, are you talking about the revenue sharing? That, that's right. That's oh, okay. right. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I was just thinking about that yesterday, uh, John, because I haven't heard really anybody talk about that. Maybe they have talked about that recently, but I haven't heard, like, really anybody talk about that. They talked about that under... 
uh, Governor Snyder, the revenue share, I think it was like $200 million that, that the state owes the city of Detroit. Well, wait, 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 yeah, the state owes over $200 million in the revenue share that they didn't get that money. Mm -hmm. but now, the, the, the city and the taxpayers, if they pay out $700 million, they'll get one of my other parents and their homes and so forth. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so that that deals with the overassessment on the taxes. The, uh, the, that that deals with the the overassessment when it comes to the prison. I posted articles on my Facebook page about that. Uh, the overassessment when it came to the values of homes in Detroit. Uh, the Detroit yeah. News had a huge study that that really documented and exposes. There, there, there have been other articles about this, but the, the most probably the most recent one was like last week from the Detroit News. And, and and what this did was it showed systematically how homes in Detroit the value was over appraised, which then increased the property taxes owed on those homes, and which caused a lot of people in Detroit, especially African Americans, to lose their homes, homes that they own, property. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Right, right. So I know I was reading about a lawsuit. I'm not sure where the lawsuit is or what have you, but oh yeah, we definitely need to sue over that, man. Because uh, for a lot of African Americans, their biggest asset that they have is their home. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, John. All right, thanks for calling, man. Okay, brother, thank you. All right, uh, so... May 8, 1967, Dr. King was interviewed by NBC News. Uh, this took place at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Georgia. And Dr. King talked about a new phase in the civil rights movement. Let's go to this clip. Civil rights, King, Van Oker, Roll 20, Sound 36. Dr. King, this church is as good a place as any to go back over your commitment to the civil rights movement. When you went out from here in the university and then you went to Montgomery, Alabama and started the bus boycotts there, what was the philosophy of the civil rights movement as you saw it then, more than 10 years ago? Well, I would say then the philosophy was that we must go all out to use legal and nonviolent methods to gain 